The following program has been made possible by financial support from the Camille and Henry Dreyfus Foundation. Welcome to Science in the Written Word. I'm Lou Massa. I'm speaking to Dr. Eugene Strauss, author of the book Rosalind Yallow, Nobel Laureate, Her Life and Work in Medicine. It's published by Plenum Press. Dr. Strauss is a professor of medicine and chief of digestive diseases at SUNY Downstate Medical Center. He's published widely in the scientific literature. He's been a scientific colleague of Dr. Rosalind Yallow long before becoming her biographer. Nice to have you here, Dr. Strauss. It's good to be here. I wonder if you could get us uh, started, perhaps, by reading a uh, paragraph from your book. I'm thinking of a paragraph in the first chapter on page six. They met and hit it off famously. After half an hour, I knew he was the smartest person I have ever met, she remembers, and she treasures that first memory of meeting him. Those who knew Yallow and Burson in the early days have their own renditions of that first meeting. The two scientists played math games for hours. They began, di began discussing insulin because Yallow's husband was a diabetic. According to Yallow, none of the th stories are true, but it was the beginning of what is generally considered to be among the most dynamic, productive, and interesting partnerships in the history of science. That meeting was the birthplace of a partnership that would, for the first time, bring an American woman to the highest level of scientific accomplishment and, like her radioactive tracers, her career can guide us to understanding more profoundly the plight of women in science and society. Thank you. Um, to g I wonder if we could now just talk for a few minutes about uh, this radio immunoassay. Apparently, it was important enough that uh, Yellow was awarded the Nobel Prize. Could we just speak for a minute about what is RIA? Is it possible to define it? in some relatively simple way? Sure. Radio immunoassay is a method which can be broadly applied to very accurately detect and quantitate even the most infinitesimally, vanishingly small concentrations of almost any substance in a tissue or in a body fluid or wherever it might be found. Good. So it's, it, the essence of it is it's a, a means of getting concentration of, concentrations of chemicals in the blood, actually. In the blood or in tissues or in other body fluids. Uh -huh. uh, it's used uh, now in uh, large commercial operations so that in the extraction of materials from plants or uh, materials that are found in nature uh, can be measured using radioimmunoassay. So that so many things that uh, were thought to be uh, somewhere, like a hormone in the blood, a peptide hormone like insulin, which is absolutely necessary for life, and which at the time uh, before Raz made this assay uh, was known to be uh, controlling blood sugar and that something was wrong with it when people had diabetes. But these things, including insulin, couldn't be measured. They couldn't be uh, accurately determined as to whether they were too much of it or too little of it. And this uh, method allowed the accurate measurement of uh, first insulin and then many other peptide hormones and then has been applied to so many substances that one can't keep a list. Yes. But for example, if you go to a hospital, uh, your blood is going to be many things in your blood will be measured with this and the blood that you might receive uh, if you need a transfusion will be checked for safety uh, with respect to viruses like the hepatitis viruses using radioimmunoassay. So this method, for example, uh, played a role in uh, eliminating post-transfusion hepatitis that people might get after uh, get chronic yeah. hepatitis after a blood transfusion. Yeah. So this is a method of tremendous importance, clearly. It, it revolutionized virtually all of biomedical science and medicine, of course. Uh, let's talk a bit about um, 
the work that uh, led up to this, this great work on insulin. Um, my impression is that Yalo and Burson were, as a, a kind of a starter problem, thinking about the volume of blood and the measurement of volume. Now, it's kind of interesting that as recently as the 50s, one would be worried about volume of blood, I suppose. But isn't it a fact that there weren't any accurate measurements of volume, say, of human blood at that time? It's a fact that one of the first applications of the availability of radioisotopes in medicine, and you know, at the time that they began their work, uh, just before the era of the 1950s and the late 40s, uh, radioisotopes became available for use in medical science as a byproduct uh, from reactors, particularly the one in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. So here were these uh, radioisotopes that could be used, and here were these bright young people who wanted to use them as a powerful tool to uh, dissect some physiologic problems. One of those was uh, relating to blood volume and how do you measure uh, how much blood is circulating in, in the human body. Uh, since the time of Galen, it was uh, known that the blood circulates and is very important uh, to deliver and remove materials from tissues, but the actual volume of blood was difficult to measure. The first ways of doing it was to take a condemned <laughs> man and to uh, bleed him out, to right. sever so there major must be veins an accuracy and, and, in that. and count it all up in a, in yeah. a, in a pail. Yeah. That was not so good for the, uh, for the subject of the uh, research, and it wasn't very accurate. And not very reproducible, I would imagine. Right. Yeah. So w what is the essential idea of using the radioactivity, that you dilute a fixed amount of radioactivity in the blood, and the more it becomes diluted, the greater the volume of blood? Is that the essence of the idea? Exactly. Yeah. And, um, what about other uses of radioactivity that they would have gotten into before uh, insulin? Did they were concerned with the problem of iodine metabolism, actually? Right. And iodine, of course, is a, a very important uh, element in the uh, human economy, and particularly with respect to uh, the hormone of the thyroid gland, thyroxin, which is uh, yeah. basically a radioiodinated, uh, an iodinated. Uh, uh, amino acid, uh, tyrosine, which is slightly modified and then has iodine incorporated into it, and it becomes thyroxine, the hormone of the thyroid gland. So they began to study the body's economy or metabolism of thyroxine using a radioisotope of iodine, I-131, mm -hmm. uh, to uh, measure uh, certain study certain aspects uh, with respect is to Is the iodine. basic problem there the, the rate of the uptake of the iodine by the, uh, the gland, the thyroid gland? Well, there's a host of problems that they encountered in studying uh, uh, the thyroid gland's uh, function using radioactive iodine as a tracer. Uh, there are, there's the problem of the incorporation of the iodine into the radioactive iodine into the uh, thyroxine molecule and the fact that uh, as it gets uh, metabolized, free iodide uh, is uh, removed from the radioactive uh, hormone, and uh, that has to be accounted for. So there were many technical problems that they encountered, and uh, a lot of it. Uh, for example, the ability to detect the free iodine from the iodine that's incorporated into the amino acid uh, mm -hmm. prepared the way for their later uh, work so that they were familiar with many of the problems yes. uh, that they would encounter when they started to work uh, uh, fairly uh, accidentally on the problem of uh, insulin, let, measuring let, insulin. Let's talk about that. I mean, we've so far talked about the background that kind of led up to that and prepared them for that. But um, insulin, I guess it's fair to say it's their study of insulin where they made their great uh, dis discovery and where they became fully conscious of RIA as a possibility and so on. Is, is that so? That's true. Yeah. Now, what is insulin, and uh, why is it uh, so crucial and so forth in the roughest terms? Insulin is uh, a small protein uh, that uh, is, uh, functions as a hormone, which means it's released from its site of synthesis in the 
beta cells of the islets of Langerhans in the pancreas, and it enters the bloodstream and travels through the bloodstream to many tissues of the body. Uh, and it has as its major function controlling the level of blood sugar. Uh, yeah. We know that, and it was known for some time, that when you don't have insulin, uh, for one of many reasons, uh, when the beta cells fail and you have no insulin, uh, you die very quickly in a matter of days. Right. Uh, <laughs> that type of diabetes is known as type 1 diabetes. Uh, the total failure of the beta cells of the pancreas to make insulin. Yes. Uh, and uh, that meant the uh, patient would die in a few days until uh, Banting and Best, uh, uh, working in Canada in the 1930s, uh, discovered that you could extract insulin from animal pancreata and prepare the hormone for use in human beings. And yes. From that time forward, the diabetics uh, with the type 1 diabetes could be treated, uh, could be treated and, and lived in many cases uh, uh, for uh, the natural lifespan uh, and uh, it changed everything with respect to diabetes. Yes. But the more common form of diabetes is called type 2 diabetes and the pancreas is just full of insulin. Now is this uh, the, in fact the type of diabetes that Burson and Yala were more concerned with? Yeah. Type 2. Yes. Uh, they were challenged by uh, a certain hypothesis of a, uh, a physiologist uh, who was also a psychiatrist, uh, a very interesting fellow named Arthur Mirsky, who had asked the question, why is it that the uh, common form of diabetes that happens in frequently in obese uh, uh, people who are uh, adults, uh, and uh, begin to develop high blood sugar with the attendant problems of thirst and excessive urination and damage to tissues. Why do they have diabetes? Why is their blood sugar high if the pancreas has plenty of insulin? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's the paradox they were concerned with. So, w so what was the, the flow of um, the study? I mean, what happened? And well, what did they find out? Dr. Mirsky had proposed that the reason why uh, all of these type 2 diabetics, again, this is the more common form of the illness, uh, the reason they had diabetes was that their insulin was metabolized more rapidly, too rapidly, so that the pancreas had plenty of it. It was secreted into the bloodstream appropriately when the blood sugar was going up. Right. And then uh, it just, uh, according to Dr. Mirsky's hypothesis, uh, it just disappeared too quickly. It got uh, uh, eaten up by the body, uh, it would have been metabolized some enzyme too rapidly. To break it right. down. So what, what did they find out? Well, they respect? took insulin uh, and using some of the methods that they had developed for iodinating uh, proteins and other materials in their study of uh, blood volume and their studies of the thyroid uh, hormone, they uh, iodinated it, they uh, hooked a, uh, uh, a, an atom of uh, radioactive iodine into the uh, insulin molecule and then they injected tiny amounts of that into people and followed it around to see what happened to it in the body. How long did it last in the bloodstream and compared that to uh, di uh, diabetics of various types and to normal people and uh, uh, began to see some things that were very interesting. Essentially what? I mean, was the Mirsky hypothesis approved, uh, 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 validated or disproved, actually? Well, it was, in fact, disproven. Uh, they still uh, maintained a very close friendship with Arthur Mirsky, uh, who was a great scientist and was very happy that they had disproven his hypothesis because they were getting closer to the, the truth. The, the truth. Yeah. Uh, but what they found was that uh, radioiodinated insulin, that, again, because of the iodination with a uh, radioactive uh, isotope, they could follow it around and see where it went. Uh, in fact, it stayed in the bloodstream the same amount of time, was not more rapidly metabolized uh, in uh, diabetics of various sorts. It so, was so only, the only f change that they found in the so-called half time for insulin in the circulation uh, <coughs> was that people who had previously been injected with insulins from 
pigs and uh, from uh, Cow. cows, which were used to treat yeah. diabetics in those days, and even non-diabetics who were given insulin as a form of shock therapy for psychosis. Uh, anyone who had been treated with uh, cow or pig insulin for a matter of uh, weeks or months or longer had a prolonged uh, insulin turnover. That is, insulin remained in the circulation for a longer period of time yeah. uh, based on prior treatment with uh, pig or uh, beef insulin. So the crucial difference then is if you've been treated with uh, the uh, hormone from a uh, uh, foreign uh, species, a cow, a pig, etc., somehow, for some reason, the iodine, in fact, did not break down. It was, it was, had a prolonged existence in the blood. So aren't we getting pretty close to the essential idea of RIA at this point? Well, yeah. They, in fact, what happened was they asked themselves the question, why is it that the insulin we inject into uh, subjects who have had previous treatment with uh, uh, beef or pork insulin, uh, why does it uh, have a longer uh, sojourn through the body? Uh, has it been changed in any way? And in fact, they found that it had, in that the insulin was now bound to a much larger protein. Uh, and when it was bound to this much larger protein, it didn't disappear from the circulation as rapidly. Right. Uh, that became the source of an immense controversy and uh, something that really changed the whole field of immunology. Because what they proposed was that insulin was bound to an antibody, that if you inject, if you uh, treated with insulin, uh, that's non-human in nature, uh, that it elicits an antibody response. The antibody binds the insulin and protects it from metabolism. Well, in those days, it wasn't believed that insulin could be uh, an immunogen, that insulin could stimulate the body to make antibodies. It was simply too small. Right. Was the idea. Yes. Uh, and scientific establishments, like others, tend to be conservative for both good and bad reasons. And it took a while to accept the idea that insulin could produce an antibody. Yeah. I've heard uh, Yalo at Hunter actually say that uh, her first paper was not accepted. And the whole idea of calling this antibody by its right name, an antibody, was rejected by the editors of, of a couple of journals. Yeah, uh, that's true. <laughs> uh, they... So this was a huge controversy as to whether they were really calling forth antibodies with this small peptide, insulin. It was quite controversial, although uh, ultimately they, they did prevail, of course. Uh, but it took yes. some time. Right. And, uh, uh, it, it, it changed people's notions and opened a whole world of immunology. The world of immunologic reactions between antigens and antibody that you can't see, right. that, that, that don't precipitate out, that yes. are soluble. Yes. Uh, and uh, it changed a lot about our thinking about, technically, about the energy of interaction between antigens and antibody. Uh, what really makes something antigenic? Uh, yes. Um, and, and, and again, the fact that all of these things that you can't see are actually going on. Yes. That was a, a very important. The, the presence of the antibody is uh, essential to the incredible sensitivity of this method. The fact that it is an antigen-antibody uh, interaction, in fact. Now, let me just ask, how sensitive? Is there some easy way to give uh, a rough idea of the fact that this truly is a sensitive methodology? Well, it can measure the concentration of things that are uh, nanomolar, femtomolar uh, concentrations, uh, 10 to the minus uh, 9th or even 15th moles per liter. Let me give you a little example of that. Uh, the concentration of insulin uh, in the circulation, uh, in, in its molar concentration, would be likened to the concentration of sugar if you took uh, one teaspoon of sugar, and you put it into a lake that was 60 miles long, 60 miles wide, and 30 feet deep, and you mixed <laughs> it all up, you'd have 
a concentration of sugar that's roughly similar to the concentration of insulin that circulates in the blood. Yeah. So that's not very much. You wouldn't taste it. Right. Uh, you wouldn't be able to find it by any other means. Uh, and that's true of uh, concentration of insulin, other peptide hormones, and other substances in the body. They are so powerful in their activity that yes. even in these vanishing concentrations, they exert their effects. And so you need a very powerful method to detect them and measure them and study yes. these, yes. these materials. Let, let's uh, try to leave the uh, strictly scientific uh, discussion for a moment and try to get some sense of Rosalind herself as a, as a person. C could I begin by asking you, how, how did you know uh, Yellow originally, for example? How did you come to know her? Well, it's sort of uh, a, a, a long story that I'll make very brief. Uh, when uh, Raz Yellow uh, was still teaching at Hunter College, um, it was very hard for her to get a job. Uh, there are many stories about the difficulty of this incredibly brilliant person who had broken many barriers already. Uh, through the sheer brilliance uh, that she had. Uh, still, it was hard to get a job, and uh, she was uh, teaching uh, at Hunter, but she wanted to do research. And she went a few blocks away to the Veterans Administration Hospital in the Bronx uh, <coughs> on Kingsbridge Road, very close by Hunter College in the uptown where she was working. Yes. Uh, and uh, she got a job in the uh, uh, radiology department, uh, it was clear that uh, uh, radioisotopes would be available and that they would be applied to medicine. And uh, here was a young person who was prepared to work with them, so they gave her a job. Uh, and shortly after she got there, she went to see my father, who was then the uh, chief of medicine at that hospital. And he uh, recognized her ability and put her together with his uh, young resident uh, who had just finished his training, uh, Solomon Burson. Uh, and they all were, became good friends and colleagues. Uh, so uh, my father knew Dr. Yallo, and I had met her a few times uh, that way. I see. But it wasn't until many, many years later. Uh, that you I actually a, began to work with her. And when so I was a physician in, uh, at Mount Sinai, and uh, Dr. Burson was the chief of medicine then, and he asked me to go up and work with Dr. Yallo. Yes. We're down to uh, about five minutes. Um, but could you tell me a little bit about Burson? I mean, clearly the life of uh, Yallo uh, and her scientific life certainly is, is somehow totally integrated uh, in terms of the interactions with Burson. He was crucial in some way. Can you say something about what sort of person uh, he might have been and, and what the interaction was like? Well, he was absolutely crucial, and he was a very brilliant man. Uh, but just as uh, Dr. Yallow, uh, quite amazingly, uh, won a Nobel Prize in medicine, uh, revolutionized medical science and biomedical science, she never took a single course in biology. She was trained as a nuclear physicist. She never took any biology. Similarly, Dr. Burson, who was a physician, had no real research background. Uh, so they were uh, two brilliant people from both different ends of the spectrum, in a way, from, uh, professionally, who uh, meshed extremely well in terms of their talents and abilities and in many other ways and were essential to each other's work. W could you say something about uh, the nature of the work in terms of its aspect of uh, being what I would label not big science, not big grant science, not big laboratory science. Isn't it so that they had a sort of mom and pop shop in your, uh, in the terminology of the book, and, and that, that, that they, it wasn't an archetypical sort of thing in that respect? No, uh, even for its day, and, but it's much more striking today in terms of attitudes and approaches to science, they wanted to do the most with the least. They wanted to uh, <coughs> build their own instruments when they had to uh, do that and not buy them, and to go a long way in science with the very s smallest possible amount of money. And they, and they did that, and they were very 
Uh, they never got a grant from the uh, NIH, uh, never applied for one. They used small sums of money that they got uh, through the VA uh, granting process. And uh, uh, again, they, they trained a, a small cadre of people that they especially interested yeah. in and never went to have a big empire and didn't believe in it. Uh, they never was, wanted to patent their work. They could have made millions and millions and millions if they had patented the general methodology, the but they didn't think that that was a good right. thing. Like uh, Marie Curie before her, Roz right. didn't Very think that similar. that was a good thing. Yeah. She felt that science, if you discover something, you give it to the world uh, and you don't try to make money from it. Yeah. It, it seems to me that's that... That's illegal today. In other words, most scientists sign contracts yes. with whomever they're working for that uh, um, basically create a pathway to exploit commercially whatever you might discover. Yes. Uh, wasn't Yellow actually on the same topic known to say that she probably could not have received a grant? She couldn't have gotten herself together to get a grant? Yeah, uh, that's another interesting aspect of the way scientists have to work in the process of getting grants and uh, uh, the fact that you kind of have to, you're caught in a bit of a bind and have to indicate in the uh, grant application that you know perhaps a little bit more about the process than you actually do in order to show that you uh, are going to be successful in the use of the money you're going to get. Uh, and she finds that uncomfortable and uh, likes to say she could never have gotten a grant. Yeah, interesting. We only have uh, a minute left. I, th I thought it might be great if uh, you could read one paragraph from your book which summarizes sure. uh, something of the magnificence of this contribution of RIA. It's on page 152. Radioimmunoassay was first applied to the measurement of insulin then to other peptide hormones primarily by the young researchers who came to work with Burson and Yallo. It was adapted to measure all manner of substances, including vitamins, thyroid hormones, steroids, prostaglandins, biologic amines, drugs, cyclic nucleotides, enzymes, tumor antigens, serum proteins, viruses, and many others. Burson and Yallo consistently and tirelessly broadcast the message of RAA's nearly limitless applicability and in addition to helping others to extend the method to a variety of substances, their assay for the hepatitis B virus brought RIA to the study and practice of infectious disease in a way that has saved countless of lives <coughs> and that had not been considered before. Rosalind Yellow, Nobel Laureate, Her Life and Work in Medicine. Thank you very much, Dr. Smith. Thank you so much. Yes, The preceding program has been made possible by financial support from the Camille and Henry Dreyfus Foundation.